story eleven of a changed man and other tales by thomas hardy this librivox recording is in the public domain story eleven a mere interlude chapters five through seven chapter five mr hedigan forgave the coldness of his bride's manner during and after the wedding ceremony full well aware that there had been considerable reluctance on her part to acquiesce in this neighbourly arrangement and as a philosopher of long standing holding that whatever baptista's attitude now the conditions would probably be much the same six months hence as those which ruled among other married couples an absolutely unexpected shock was given to baptista's listless mind about an hour after the wedding service they had nearly finished the midday dinner when the now husband said to her father we think of starting about two and the breeze being so fair we shall bring up inside pen zephyr new pier about six at least what are we going to pen zephyr said baptista i don't know anything of it didn't you tell her asked her father of hedigan it transpired that owing to the delay in her arrival this proposal too among other things had in the hurry not been mentioned to her except some time ago as a general suggestion that they would go somewhere hedigan had imagined that any trip would be pleasant and one to the mainland the pleasantest of all she looked so distressed at the announcement that her husband willingly offered to give it up though he had not had a holiday off the island for a whole year then she pondered on the inconvenience of staying at giant's town where all the inhabitants were bonded by the circumstances of their situation into a sort of family party which permitted and encouraged on such occasions as these oral criticism that was apt to disturb the equanimity of newly married girls and would especially worry baptista in her strange situation hence unexpectedly she agreed not to disorganize her husband's plan for the wedding jaunt and it was settled that as originally intended they should proceed in a neighbour's sailing-boat to the metropolis of the district in this way they arrived at pen zephyr without difficulty or mishap bidding adieu to jenkin and his man who had sailed them over they strolled arm in arm off the pier baptista silent cold and obedient hedigan had arranged to take her as far as plymouth before their return but to go no further than where they had landed that day their first business was to find an inn and in this they had unexpected difficulty since for some reason or other possibly the fine weather many of the nearest at hand were full of tourists and commercial travellers he led her on till he reached a tavern which though comparatively unpretending stood in as attractive a spot as any in the town and this somewhat to their surprise after their previous experience they found apparently empty the considerate old man thinking that baptista was educated to artistic notions though he himself was deficient in them had decided that it was most desirable to have on such an occasion as the present an apartment with a good view the expression being one he had often heard in use among tourists and he therefore asked for a favourite room on the first floor from which a bow-window protruded for the express purpose of affording such an outlook the landlady after some hesitation said she was sorry that particular apartment was engaged the next one however or any other in the house was unoccupied the gentleman who has the best one will give it up to-morrow and then you can change into it she added as mr hedigan hesitated about taking the adjoining and less commanding one we shall be gone to-morrow and shan't want it he said wishing not to lose customers the landlady earnestly continued that since he was bent on having the best room perhaps the other gentlemen would not object to move at once into the one they despised since though nothing could be seen from the window the room was equally large well if he doesn't care for a view said mr hedigan with the air of a highly artistic man who did 
oh no i am sure he doesn't she said i can promise that you shall have the room you want if you would not object to go for a walk for half an hour i could have it ready and your things in it and a nice tea laid in the bow window by the time you come back this proposal was deemed satisfactory by the fussy old tradesman and they went out baptista nervously conducted him in an opposite direction to her walk of the former day in other company showing on her wan face had he observed it how much she was beginning to regret her sacrificial step for mending matters that morning she took advantage of a moment when her husband's back was turned to inquire casually in a shop if anything had been heard of the gentleman who was sucked down in the eddy while bathing the shopman said oh yes his body has been washed ashore and had just handed baptista a newspaper on which she discerned the heading a schoolmaster drowned while bathing when her husband turned to join her she might have pursued the subject without raising suspicion but it was more than flesh and blood could do and completing a small purchase almost ran out of the shop what is your terrible hurry me dear said hedigan hastening after oh, I, I don't know I, I don't want to stay in shops she gasped and we won't he said they are suffocating this weather let's go back and have some tay they found the much desired apartment awaiting their entry it was a sort of combination bed and sitting-room and the table was prettily spread with high tea in the bow window a bunch of flowers in the midst and a best parlour chair on each side here they shared the meal by the ruddy light of the vanishing sun but though the view had been engaged regardless of expense exclusively for baptista's pleasure she did not direct any keen attention out of the window her gaze as often fell on the floor and walls of the room as elsewhere and on the table as much as on either beholding nothing at all but there was a change opposite her seat was the door upon which her eyes presently became riveted like those of a little bird upon a snake for on a peg at the back of the door there hung a hat such a hat surely from its peculiar make the actual hat that had been worn by charles conviction grew to certainty when she saw a railway ticket sticking up from the band charles had put the ticket there she had noticed the act her teeth almost chattered she murmured something incoherent her husband jumped up and said you are not well what is it what shall i get ee smelling salt she said quickly and desperately at that chemist's shop you were in just now he jumped up like the anxious old man that he was caught up his own hat from a back table and without observing the other hastened out and downstairs left alone she gazed and gazed at the back of the door then spasmodically rang the bell an honest-looking country maid-servant appeared in response a hat murmured baptista pointing with her finger it does not belong to us oh yes i'll take it away said the young woman with some hurry it belongs to the other gentleman she spoke with a certain awkwardness and took the hat out of the room baptista had recovered her outward composure the other gentleman she said where is the other gentleman oh he's in the next room ma'am he removed out of this to oblige ye how can you say so i should hear him if he were there said baptista sufficiently recovered to argue down an apparent untruth he's there said the girl hardily then it is strange that he makes no noise said mrs hedigan convicting the girl of falsity by a look he makes no noise but it is not strange said the servant all at once a dread took possession of the bride's heart like a cold hand laid thereon for it flashed upon her that there was a possibility of reconciling the girl's statement with her own knowledge of facts why does he make no noise she weakly said the waiting-maid was silent and looked at her questioner if i tell you ma'am you won't tell missus she whispered baptista promised because he's a lying dead said the girl he's the schoolmaster that was drowned yesterday oh 
said the bride covering her eyes then he was in this room till just now yes said the maid thinking the young lady's agitation natural enough and i told missus that i thought she oughtn't to have done it because i don't hold it right to keep visitors so much in the dark where death is concerned but she said the gentleman didn't die of anything infectious she was a poor honest innkeeper's wife she says who had to get her living by making hay while the sun shined and owing to the drowned gentleman being brought here she said it kept so many people away that we were empty though all the other houses were full so when your good man set his mind upon the room and she would have lost good paying folk if he'd not had it it wasn't to be supposed she said that she'd let anything stand in the way you won't say that i've told you please ma'am all the linen has been changed and as the inquest won't be till to-morrow after you are gone she thought you wouldn't know a word of it being strangers here the returning footsteps of her husband broke off further narration baptista waved her hand for she could not speak the waiting-maid quickly withdrew and mr hedigan entered with the smelling salts and other nostrums any better he questioned i don't like the hotel she exclaimed almost simultaneously i can't bear it it doesn't suit me is that all that's the matter he returned pettishly this being the first time of his showing such a mood upon my heart and life such trifling is trying to any man's temper baptista sending me about from here to yond and then when i come back saying ye don't like the place that i have sunk so much money and words to get it for ye oh dang it all tis enough to oh but i don't say any more at present me dear though it is just too much to expect to turn out of the house now we shan't get another quiet place at this time of the evening every other inn in the town is bustling with rackety folk of one sort and t'other while here tis as quiet as the grave the country i would say so bide ye still do ye hear till to-morrow and we shall be out of the town altogether as early as you like the obstinacy of age had in short overmastered its complaisance and the young woman said no more the simple course of telling him that in the adjoining room lay a corpse which had lately occupied their own might it would have seemed have been an effectual one without further disclosure but to allude to that subject however it was disguised was more than hedigan's young wife had strength for horror broke her down in the contingency one thing only presented itself to her paralyzed regard that here she was doomed to abide in a hideous contiguity to the dead husband and the living and her conjecture did in fact bear itself out that night she lay between the two men she had married hedigan on the one hand and on the other through the partition against which the bed stood charles stowe chapter six kindly time had withdrawn the foregoing event three days from the present of baptista hedigan it was ten o'clock in the morning she had been ill not in an ordinary or definite sense but in a state of cold stupefaction from which it was difficult to arouse her so much as to say a few sentences when questioned she had replied that she was pretty well their trip as such had been something of a failure they had gone on as far as falmouth but here he had given way to her entreaties to return home this they could not very well do without repassing through pen zephyr at which place they had now again arrived in the train she had seen a weekly local paper and read there a paragraph detailing the inquest on charles it was added that the funeral was to take place at his native town of rudredon on friday after reading this she had shown no reluctance to enter the fatal neighbourhood of the tragedy only stipulating that they should take their rest at a different lodging from the first and now comparatively braced up and calm indeed a cooler creature altogether than when last in the town she said to david that she wanted to walk out for a while as they had plenty of time on their hands to a shop as usual i suppose me dear 
partly for shopping she said and it will be best for you dear to stay in after trotting about so much and have a good rest while i am gone he assented and baptista sallied forth as she had stated her first visit was made to a shop a draper's without the exercise of much choice she purchased a black bonnet and veil also a black stuff gown a black mantle she already wore these articles were made up into a parcel which in spite of the saleswoman's offers her customer said she would take with her bearing it on her arm she turned to the railway and at the station got a ticket for redruton thus it appeared that on her recovery from the paralyzed mood of the former day while she had resolved not to blast utterly the happiness of her present husband by revealing the history of the departed one she had also determined to indulge a certain odd inconsequent feminine sentiment of decency to the small extent to which it could do no harm to any person at redruton she emerged from the railway carriage in the black attire purchased at the shop having during the transit made the change in the empty compartment she had chosen the other clothes were now in the bandbox and parcel leaving these at the cloak-room she proceeded onward and after a wary survey reached the side of a hill whence a view of the burial-ground could be obtained it was now a little before two o'clock while baptista waited a funeral procession ascended the road baptista hastened across and by the time the procession entered the cemetery gates she had unobtrusively joined it in addition to the schoolmaster's own relatives not a few the paragraph in the newspapers of his death by drowning had drawn together many neighbours acquaintances and onlookers among them she passed unnoticed and with a quiet step pursued the winding path to the chapel and afterwards thence to the grave when all was over and the relatives and idlers had withdrawn she stepped to the edge of the chasm from beneath her mantle she drew a little bunch of forget-me-nots and dropped them in upon the coffin in a few minutes she also turned and went away from the cemetery by five o'clock she was again in pen zephyr you have been a mortal long time said her husband crossly i allowed you an hour at most me dear it occupied me longer said she well i reckon it is wasting words to complain hang it you look so tired and wish that i can't find heart to say what i would i am weary and wished david i am we can go home to-morrow for certain i hope we can and please god we will said mr heddegan heartily as if he too were weary of his brief honeymoon i must be into business again on monday morning at latest they left by the next morning steamer and in the afternoon took up their residence in their own house at giant's town the hour that she reached the island it was as if a material weight had been removed from baptista's shoulders her husband attributed the change to the influence of the local breezes after the hot-house atmosphere of the mainland however that might be settled here a few doors from her mother's dwelling she recovered in no very long time much of her customary bearing which was never very demonstrative she accepted her position calmly and faintly smiled when her neighbours learned to call her mrs heddegan and said she seemed likely to become the leader of fashion in giant's town her husband was a man who had made considerably more money by trade than her father had done and perhaps the greater profusion of surroundings at her command than she had heretofore been mistress of was not without an effect upon her one week two weeks three weeks passed and being pre-eminently a young woman who allowed things to drift she did nothing whatever either to disclose or conceal traces of her first marriage or to learn if there existed possibilities which there undoubtedly did by which that hasty contract might become revealed to those about her at any unexpected moment while yet within the first month of her marriage and on an evening just before sunset baptista was standing within her garden adjoining the house when she saw passing along the road a personage clad in a greasy black coat and battered tall hat 
which common enough in the slums of a city had an odd appearance in st maria's the tramp as he seemed to be marked her at once bonnetless and unwrapped as she was her features were plainly recognizable and with an air of friendly surprise came and leant over the wall what don't you know me said he she had some dim recollection of his face but said that she was not acquainted with him why your witness to be sure ma'am don't you mind the man that was mending the church window when you and your intended husband walked up to be made one and the clerk called me down from the ladder and i came and did my part by writing my name and occupation baptista glanced quickly around her husband was out of earshot that would have been of less importance but for the fact that the wedding witnessed by this personage had not been the wedding with mr hedigan but the one on the day previous i've had a misfortune since then that's pulled me under continued her friend but don't let me damp your wedded joy by naming the particulars yes i've seen changes since though tis but a short time ago let me see only a month next week i think for twere the first or second day in august yes that's when it was said another man a sailor who had come up with a pipe in his mouth and felt it necessary to join in baptista having receded to escape further speech for that was the first time i set foot in giant's town and her husband took her to him the same day a dialogue then proceeded between the two men outside the wall which baptista could not help hearing ay i signed the book that made her one flesh repeated the decayed glazier where's her goodman oh about the premises somewhere but you don't see em together much replied the sailor in an undertone you see he's older than she older i should never have thought it from my own observation said the glazier he was a remarkably handsome man handsome well there he is we can see for ourselves david hedigan had indeed just shown himself at the upper end of the garden and the glazier looking in bewilderment from the husband to the wife saw the latter turn pale now that decayed glazier was a far-seeing and cunning man too far-seeing and cunning to allow himself to thrive by simple and straightforward means and he held his peace till he could read more plainly the meaning of this riddle merely adding carelessly well marriage do alter a man tis true i should never ha knowed him he then stared oddly at the disconcerted baptista and moving on to where he could again address her asked her to do him a good turn since he once had done the same for her understanding that he meant money she handed him some at which he thanked her and instantly went away chapter seven she had escaped exposure on this occasion but the incident had been an awkward one and should have suggested to baptista that sooner or later the secret must leak out as it was she suspected that at any rate she had not heard the last of the glazier in a day or two when her husband had gone to the old town on the other side of the island there came a gentle tap at the door and the worthy witness of her first marriage made his appearance a second time it took me hours to get to the bottom of the mystery hours he said with a gaze of deep confederacy which offended her pride very deeply but thanks to a good intellect i've done it now ma'am i'm not a man to tell tales even when a tale would be so good as this but i'm going back to the mainland again and a little assistance would be as rain on thirsty ground i helped you two days ago began baptista yes but what was that my good lady not enough to pay my passage to pen zephyr i came over on your account for i thought there was a mystery somewhere now i must go back on my own mind this twould be very awkward for you if your old man were to know he's a queer temper though he may be fond she knew as well as her visitor how awkward it would be and the hush money she paid was heavy that day she had however the satisfaction of watching the man to the steamer and seeing him diminish out of sight but baptista perceived that the system into which she had been led of purchasing silence thus was one fatal to her peace of mind particularly if it had to be continued 
hearing no more from the glazier she hoped the difficulty was past but another week only had gone by when as she was pacing the giant's walk the name given to the promenade she met the same personage in the company of a fat woman carrying a bundle this is the lady my dear he said to his companion this ma'am is my wife we've come to settle in the town for a time if so be we can find room that you won't do said she nobody can live here who is not privileged i am privileged said the glazier by my trade baptista went on but in the afternoon she received a visit from the man's wife this honest woman began to depict in forcible colours the necessity for keeping up the concealment i will intercede with my husband ma'am she said he's a true man if rightly managed and i'll beg him to consider your position tis a very nice house you've got here she added glancing round and well worth a little sacrifice to keep it the unlucky baptista staved off the danger on this third occasion as she had done on the previous two but she formed a resolve that if the attack were once more to be repeated she would face a revelation worse though that must now be than before she had attempted to purchase silence by bribes her tormentors never believing her capable of acting upon such an intention came again but she shut the door in their faces they retreated muttering something but she went to the back of the house where david hedigan was she looked at him unconscious of all the case was serious she knew that well and all the more serious in that she liked him better now than she had done at first yet as she herself began to see the secret was one that was sure to disclose itself her name and charles's stood indelibly written in the registers and though a month only had passed as yet it was a wonder that his clandestine union with her had not already been discovered by his friends thus spurring herself to the inevitable she spoke to hedigan david come indoors i have something to tell you he hardly regarded her at first she had discerned that during the last week or two he had seemed preoccupied as if some private business harassed him she repeated her request he replied with a sigh yes certainly me dear when they had reached the sitting-room and shut the door she repeated faintly david i have something to tell you a sort of tragedy i have concealed you will hate me for having so far deceived you but perhaps my telling you voluntarily will make you think a little better of me than you would do otherwise tragedy he said awakening to interest much you can know about tragedies me dear that have been in the world so short a time she saw that he suspected nothing and it made her task the harder but on she went steadily it is about something that happened before we were married she said indeed not a very long time before a short time and it is about a lover she faltered i don't much mind that he said mildly in truth i was in hopes twas more in hopes well yes this screwed her up to the necessary effort i met my old sweetheart he scorned me chid me dared me and i went and married him we were coming straight here to tell you all that we had done but he was drowned and i thought i would say nothing about him and i married you david for the sake of peace and quietness i've tried to keep it from you but have found i cannot there that's the substance of it and you can never never forgive me i am sure she spoke desperately but the old man instead of turning black or blue or slaying her in his indignation jumped up from his chair and began to caper around the room in quite an ecstatic emotion oh happy thing how well it falls out he exclaimed snapping his fingers over his head ha ha the knot is cut i see a way out of my trouble ha ha she looked at him without uttering a sound till as he still continued smiling joyfully she said oh what do you mean is it done to torment me 
oh no no oh me dear your story helps me out of the most heart-aching quandary a poor man ever found himself in you see it is this i've got a tragedy too and unless you had had one to tell i could never have seen my way to tell mine what is yours what is it she asked with altogether a new view of things well it is a bouncer mine is a bouncer said he looking on the ground and wiping his eyes not worse than mine well that depends upon how you look at it yours had to do with the past alone and i don't mind it you see we've been married a month and it don't jar upon me as it would if we'd only been married a day or two now mine refers to past present and future so that past present and future she murmured it never occurred to me that you had a tragedy too but i have he said shaking his head in fact four then tell him cried the young woman i will i will but be considerate i beg ye me dear well i wasn't a bachelor when i married ye any more than you were a spinster just as you was a widow woman i was a widow man ah said she with some surprise but is that all then we are nicely balanced she added relieved no it is not all there's the point i am not only a widower oh david i am a widower with four tragedies that is to say four strapping girls the eldest taller than you don't he look so struck dumb-like it fell out in this way i knew the poor woman their mother in pen zephyr for some years and to cut a long story short i privately married her at last just before she died i kept the matter secret but it is getting known among the people here by degrees i've long felt for the children that it is my duty to have them here and do something for them i have not had courage to break it to ee but i've seen lately that it would soon come to your ears and that have worried me are they educated said the ex-schoolmistress no i am sorry to say that they have been much neglected in truth they can hardly read and so i thought that by marrying a young schoolmistress i should get some one in the house who could teach em and bring em into genteel condition all for nothing you see they are growed up too tall to be sent to school oh mercy she almost groaned four great girls to teach the rudiments to and have always in the house with me spelling over their books and i hate teaching it kills me i am bitterly punished i am i am you'll get used to em me dear and the balance of secrets mine against yours will comfort your heart with a sense of justice i could send for em this week very well and i will in faith i could send this very day baptista you have relieved me of all my difficulty thus the interview ended so far as this matter was concerned baptista was too stupefied to say more and when she went away to her room she wept from very mortification at mr heddegan's duplicity education the one thing she abhorred the shame of it to delude a young wife so the next meal came round as they sat baptista would not suffer her eyes to turn towards him he did not attempt to intrude upon her reserve but every now and then looked under the table and chuckled with satisfaction at the aspect of affairs how very well matched we be he said comfortably next day when the steamer came in baptista saw her husband rush down to meet it and soon after there appeared at her door four tall hipless shoulderless girls dwindling in height and size from the eldest to the youngest like a row of pan-pipes at the head of them standing heddegan he smiled pleasantly through the grey fringe of his whiskers and beard and turning to the girl said now come forward and shake hands properly with your stepmother thus she made their acquaintance and he went out leaving them together on examination the poor girls turned out to be not only plain-looking which she could have forgiven but to have such a lamentably 
meagre intellectual equipment as to be hopelessly inadequate as companions even the eldest almost her own age could only read with difficulty words of two syllables and taste in dress was beyond their comprehension in the long vista of future years she saw nothing but dreary drudgery at her detested old trade without prospect of reward she went about quite despairing during the next few days an unpromising unfortunate mood for a woman who had not been married six weeks from her parents she concealed everything they had been amongst the few acquaintances of hedigan who knew nothing of his secret and were indignant enough when they saw such a ready-made household foisted upon their only child but she would not support them in their remonstrances no you don't yet know all she said thus baptista had sense enough to see the retributive fairness of this issue for some time whenever conversation arose between her and hedigan which was not often she always said i am miserable and you know it yet i don't wish things to be otherwise but one day when he asked how do you like em now her answer was unexpected much better than i did she said quietly i may like them very much some day this was the beginning of a serener season for the chastened spirit of baptista hedigan she had in truth discovered underneath the crust of uncouthness and meagre articulation which was due to their troglodydian existence that her unwelcomed daughters had natures that were unselfish almost to sublimity the harsh discipline accorded to their young lives before their mother's wrong had been righted had operated less to crush them than to lift them above all personal ambition they considered the world and its contents in a purely objective way and their own lot seemed only to affect them as that of certain human beings among the rest whose troubles they knew rather than suffered this was such an entirely new way of regarding life to a woman of baptista's nature that her attention from being first arrested by it became deeply interested by imperceptible pulses her heart expanded in sympathy with theirs the sentences of her tragic comedy her life confused till now became clearer daily that in humanity as exemplified by these girls there was nothing to dislike but infinitely much to pity she learnt with the lapse of each week in their company she grew to like the girls of unpromising exterior and from liking she got to love them till they formed an unexpected point of junction between her own and her husband's interests generating a sterling friendship at least between a pair in whose existence there had threatened to be neither friendship nor love october eighteen eighty five End of story 11, chapters 5 through 7. End of A Changed Man and Other Tales by Thomas Hardy.